All right, we want to welcome you in to our Easter night uh, Bible study. Hopefully, uh, when you're watching this, the weather isn't too crazy. Uh, we hope that you definitely are staying safe with your family. Uh, we've got a special night tonight. We're going to bring in all five of us together. We've got Ben, uh, who is our pulpit minister at Highland Park, Travis Creasy, the one and only uh, minister over there at Riverside, uh, Blake Holloman, uh, one of our great ministry volunteers at Highland Park, and then Wes Ayers down at the bottom, uh, who is one of the ministers out at the Shiloh Congregation. So we wanted to get everyone together uh, this evening to study. Once again, we're going to be going uh, with one of the parables. It's going to be found in Matthew 18, and we're going to look at the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, ben had a great message this morning uh, dealing with the resurrection of kind of Joseph and Jesus, uh, and it dealt a lot with the forgiveness that the resurrection of Jesus brings into all of our lives. And so, Ben, I'm going to kick it over to you and let you kind of give us a rundown, and then we'll look into the parable. Yeah, as we were talking this morning, as I was doing that lesson, I kept wanting to go to Matthew chapter 18, just because this, this story is just a powerful story in and of itself. We talked about resurrecting forgiveness in our lives. Joseph forgave his brothers and um, did some really great things for them, uh, even in the end, years, you know, 13 years after they had sold him into slavery. Um, and then, of course, Jesus uh, was resurrected, and because of his resurrection, we find forgiveness of our sins. And so there's this parable that, that Jesus tells that reminds us that not just uh, is it important that he forgave us, but that we turn that around. We mentioned the Lord's Prayer that we find in Matthew chapter 6. Um, we, we find that in that prayer, he, he talks about if you forgive others, um, their trespasses, then the Heavenly Father will forgive you your trespasses. And I think that's a pretty important statement, uh, considering that, you know, the my forgiveness is sort of based on the way that I forgive. And uh, so this story a little later in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, really digs into that and reminds us um, of the importance of it. So I wanted us to look at this. And of course, it comes much like most of his stories because of a, of a question or a scenario that happens, it starts in verse 21 with Peter coming to him and asking that question, how often should I forgive? Uh, and that's a, that's a pretty big question. How, how much should I forgive? You probably, all of us, uh, whether you know, the guys here in the video or uh, you watching at home have probably had people that have tried those uh, tried that question a little bit on us or, 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 or tried those boundaries on us. You know, how often should I forgive them because they just keep messing up? And, uh, and so when he asked that question, um, he asked and, and he gives like this, uh, should it be up to seven times? Is that, is that what we should do? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And it's with that that he's going to tell this parable. So that's kind of the scenario or that's, that's what's leading into the story that we're going to tell. You guys got anything to add to the background of that? Travis, Blake, Wes, Will, anybody? I think that Peter probably thought seven times was pretty, pretty decent. I mean, if you think from people I've heard, you know, you, you cross me once and we're done, you know, and I'm not going to trust you anymore you know, that's a little different than forgiveness, obviously. We want to be wise, but, you know, I think that Peter's probably like, you know, that's a pretty good number. It's a biblical number. It's a complete number that is kind of a theme in the Bible. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that it, prior to this, I probably would have agreed seven times is pretty, pretty good number. Uh, I mean, that's, that's forgiving people quite a bit, uh, more so than the world probably, I mean, would, would say, I guess, but It's not like he just pulled a number, you know, out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, well, we'll go with seven. You know, th there's a there's a meaning behind the number there. And then, of course, when Jesus goes, oh, I'd, yeah, multiply that by 70. And, and then we're, we might be talking and it's kind of like, oh, well, all right. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it seems like a, a pretty significant number, but especially when you know how that they looked at that number in that time as being complete and whole and, hey, I've done my duty and I can wash my hands of it but Jesus sort of takes it way beyond that extreme. 
Wes, you got anything on that? Yeah, I think it kind of gives us a, a very quick glimpse into just how patient we have to be with people. I think it kind of shows the leash that we're given, first of all, and I think it sort of shows the leash that we have to give to other people as well, because you know, there, there's people in our lives that, you know, that it seems like we're constantly having to go back to the well with them or, or they're coming back to us because, you know, we, we do mess up so frequently. And it's just one of those things where it, it, for me personally, it's like I have the same conversations with the same people pretty repetitively because you just never know. I mean, you just never know at what length you've gone to or how far you've stretched uh, someone's patience level with you. So I think this is, you know, right out of the gate here in verse uh, 22, <laughs> yeah, seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That lets us know the length of the leash has to be pretty substantial. Blake, if you can, more than welcome to throw some thoughts in here um, before you read. But if you don't mind, uh, you're you have always kind of been our reader here. Uh, do you want to do verses twenty three through uh, thirty five, which is the end of the parable? Um, you yeah. can welcome to throw some thoughts before you do that, if you have any. No, we'll just go ahead and jump into the scripture. Okay. Matthew eighteen, verse twenty three. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who is wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and they went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. So, it's, you know, it's a, a pretty crazy comparison that we read. Like I said, back in Matthew chapter six, Jesus tells, uh, you know, how to pray. And when he gets to the end of this prayer, you know, he said, you know, give us this day our day daily bread. He's talked about our father who aren't in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. You know, there's all these different things that are mentioned in it. And just one phrase out of that prayer, verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. But when he gets to the end of the prayer, the thing he focuses on is for if you forgive others of their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your, your father will not forgive your trespasses. You know, we think about how loving and kind and merciful God is, and the amount of debt that this man owed was astronomical compared to what this friend of his owed him. We're talking years worth of wages versus a couple of months, maybe. And so you've got this guy who is, you know, just determined uh, that he can't pay this, and the master graciously gives him um, a pass on it. And then you've got him going to another servant and saying, but you're going to pay me every dime. And how, you know, when we look at this, how often do we see this sort of thing within the church or within mankind as a whole? We know 
every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know how much we've messed up in comparison to the great God that we serve. But yet, how much do we see this happening where we go and demand something of someone else that God has sort of given us this, this leniency and this grace and this mercy? I think it's, I think it's interesting what you're saying. And it brought up a thought in my mind as a Christian and as someone doing my best and not doing a great job at it, you know, when it comes to living this Christian life, always, I've always got more room to grow. It brings up this idea. I don't think I've ever found it necessarily difficult to forgive someone. Now I, I, I base that on, I've never had people in my life hurt me bad enough to really me just have issue with really struggling to forgive someone. And so I know that people that are listening and maybe even some of you guys, you've had people that have severely hurt you enough that, that forgiving them has been a task. But I guess I look at it in my life and go, how, how much do I seek out forgiving people? You, you know, and I don't know that that may make sense. It may not make sense. I, I'm not real sure, but like, in my mind, I'm trying to think as a Christian, how willing am I just to go out and forgive, you know, and really just go, hey, I'm going to share this message with everybody, even if you, because I know there's a lot of people that I've looked at in the world and gone, ah, man, I don't know that they would ever follow Jesus. And maybe in a sense, I'm being that person that says, I don't know that they're willing to repent themselves. So I'm not even going to go try and make that opportunity or or give them that chance. And so I guess I look at this in my own life and go, I know how much God has forgiven me, but, but as a, a person in my life right now, I, I don't have a lot of people that have done things that are hard for me to overcome. But I guess I'm still trying to figure out how I can actively be pursuing these people more. And, and hopefully by trying to actively pursue them more, I'm showing them what God's doing for me in my own life. And, and so, yes, this resonates, but there's still kind of that difficulty of trying to just go out and go, look, God loves you and he forgives you. And I don't care what your past is. I want you to be a part of Jesus it is kind of where I'm at in my life right now. Anybody else? I think it's interesting to note Matthew's job. What is Matthew's job, at least prior to becoming a disciple, is collecting taxes. And so there's a lot, uh, and I've been watching The Chosen uh, show, and, you know, it seems like uh, in, in his book, in, in his gospel, there's a lot about debt, you know. And so I think, I think Matthew is pretty close to this situation, you know, whether this is an exact situation that Jesus is alluding to. But, you know, he's seen similar people in debt, and what they do, obviously working with the Romans, taking taxes from them. Um, and so, and then not only that, but basically being viewed as a traitor to his people, you know? And so I think that, that this story certainly would hit home for him as it does me. And to just talk about what Will's saying, you know, I, I've had a situation in my life where I've forgiven someone and I've, I've gotten to the point in my life that it's not really, even if they never say they're sorry or they even understand how they wronged me, it in a selfish way streamlines my life not to have and carry that baggage. And it's taken a long time. You know, I've, I've had somebody come to me, has a similar situation and goes, you know, this person is saying all kinds of stuff about me. They're, they're a younger person. And I said, you know, just, you know, forgive them as much as you can. And I'm not saying that's easy, but I said, you know, one day they're going to grow up. You know, and, and I, in my situation, I was wronged and I didn't handle it well. You know, I, I wanted to run them down. I didn't think much about them, blah, blah, blah. You know, they mistreated me and that. And, you know, I got older and finally I had that moment where I just went to them and I said, listen, you know, I don't know if you understand that you've hurt me or how you've hurt me, but I want you to know that I forgive you. And, and it's, it's under, it's gone, it's done. As far as I'm concerned, our relationship can be what it's supposed to be. Now, it's not great. It's not where I like it to be, but it's not because of me. You know, it's not because I'm holding back because they hurt me, you know. And so kind of off your point there, Will, you know, it's 
not easy per se, but you know, if you can kind of get it in that point where it's, Hey, what's going to simplify my life to hold this grudge and let it, let me carry that weight every single day or do my best to jettison, you know, and I think about Hebrews where it says, you know, lay aside every weight, you know, every sin that so easily besets you. And I think we have an example in Jesus, you know, father, forgive them. They know not what they do, you know, and Jesus extends. Now, is that justification? They're going to be in heaven forgiveness. I don't know, but they don't look up and go, Oh Jesus, we're sorry. You're on the cross. And then he goes, okay, well, I forgive you. You know, yeah. um, it, it's a, it's a disciple. It's a discipline, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Wes, you started to say something a while ago, too. Yeah, I think sometimes, I, well, I know for me personally, sometimes I will put sin in different compartments, <laughs> and I will look at different sins differently, and that's the wrong approach. And sometimes I have been guilty, and, and I'm thankful that I have matured in my faith and my faith has strengthened, but I can remember being a, a younger Christian and when somebody would be in the same boat that I'm in, struggling with the same thing that I'm in, it's almost like I would downplay my own personal sin and try to upplay their sin, even though it's the same thing, even though they're involved and struggling with the same thing, I would downplay it on my end and upplay it on theirs because, you know, we, we want to have that I'm forgiven. I don't have that stress. I don't have that um, baggage, the, the word that Travis used. I don't have that on me, but look at what they did. You know, it's kind of like when we talked on Wednesday, we talked about uh, the Pharisee and the, the tax collector who were praying. You know, the, the prayers were different. And sometimes I have been guilty of doing that with my own sin. It's just kind of trying to downplay it and then focus on the other thing. And what I found out was, especially in ministry, is there are people who are constantly hurting and there are people who are constantly trying to right the ship guys and I mean and you know that there are people who are trying to do better every single day and if we downplay ours and focus on theirs then it becomes more of a burden for them and in the long run it becomes more of a burden for us because I think Travis is making a great point if we are spiritually and strong enough and our faith is root, rooted deeply enough that we can say, okay, they don't know. They, they really have no idea that they've hurt me or that they've crossed me, but we still have the faithfulness to say, you, you have no idea what you've done, but I can forgive you for that. That's, that's a huge step in our faith and in our journey and in our walk with God. So I think one thing that I've really tried to separate myself away from is kind of falling into this trap here that we're talking about in Matthew 18 is I don't want to downplay mine and try to upplay somebody else's because we can't compartmentalize sin. I mean, no sin is greater than the other. So we can't be found guilty of trying to pinpoint other people's sin when we're just as guilty as anybody else. Our job is to when we're forgiven, be forgivers. I mean, that's that's what we were supposed to be doing. Wes, did you watch Ben Hayes' sermon this morning by chance? <laughs> I did not. I was too busy trying to uh, keep our live stream running because we got hit with lightning right in the middle of service. So. <laughs> well, well, I, I say that because you guys had a lot, a lot of the same points. Ben's four points this morning were dead, alive, guilty and forgiveness and you mentioned all that in what you just went through you know when we look at uh, the concept of forgiveness it can be a little bit extreme I, th I think everything that we uh, see in this parable deals with extremes uh, we see 70 times 7 you know that's that comes out to 490 times that we're forgiving uh, I did I, I looked up online 10,000 talents I, I don't know if this is correct Ben you can uh, correct me here, but it said somewhere close to 150,000 years of wages, something, ex something extreme like that. And so yeah. the, um, the, the concept of forgiveness, some, someone immediately does you, or someone does you wrong and you immediately forgive them. That just seems kind of extreme. And I think Jesus is trying to teach us the fact that being radical 
being extreme as a Christian is okay. Like he, he came and he changed things in such a way. He completely flipped every thought that we had upside down. And so when we see the first slave here, he was dead where he did, he didn't have, have an opportunity. Then he was alive um, from his debts being forgiven and then he dealt with forgive, uh, with being guilty, and, and he had a choice to make whether he was going to forgive um, the, the other slave there, and, and he, he did not make the right choice, and we see what happened there. So that, that, uh, that's kind of what jumped out to me. Ben it, and Blake, it kind of goes hand in hand. Verse 32, you're talking about the radical and the extremes that you see the verse that stuck out to me as we were reading it and kind of as I was looking at it was verse 32. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? You talk about, you know, how, however big this debt is, is not what frustrated the master. Right. You know, what frustrated the master was, you didn't respond in the way that I responded to you. And I know there's a lot of times the things that I struggle with sometimes the most is trying to figure out how to forgive myself of everything that I've done. When in reality, Jesus says, I've already taken care of that. Stop worrying about that part. Here's your job. And your job is to just go forgive. You know, and I think so many times we look at it and we go, okay, are all my sins forgiven? You know, and I'm growing up, I grew up in a rural church and it was always father forgive us of the sins of omission and commission, you know, the, the ones we know about and the ones we don't know about. And, and I, and I think that's great. And I pray to the Lord every day, Hey, forgive me of, of all of my wrongs. But I think the point in the extreme here that Jesus is making is, Hey, I'm handling that part. You go and handle this part. And, and the servants called wicked, not because of all this debt he had, but because of the way he responded after his debt had been taken care of. And I think that's kind of an interesting thought that Jesus kind of puts in front of us. Yeah. It's not so much about his own wickedness. Uh, Blake, to your point, um, the, the kind of middle part in my Bible that tells how much each thing is worth. It does say a talent's worth more than 15 years wages of a laborer. So you do the math, you know, you think about eternity. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> literally eternity it would take to pay that off and a denarius is a day's wage and uh so this guy owes a hundred denarius i think um you know he owe, owes somewhere around a hundred days worth of money to this other one and so you know the the comparison of what our sin looks like before god and these petty little things that we use to forgive people of um, and really this whole chapter has been about forgiveness. If you look back in the context of things, he starts off with receiving the kingdom of heaven like a child, whoever humbles himself, starts with that, which seems like he starts a lot of these parables off somehow re re reminding us to be humble in the way that we deal with people. He talks about stumbling blocks. You know, don't be the stumbling block. Don't be the one who causes someone to fall the 99 plus one, uh, you know, it's kind of another story, another parable, but the idea of rejoicing over the one who's gone astray. And then he goes into this conversation about discipline and prayer. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you that by the mouth of three or two, wit uh, two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be as a Gentile or a tax collector. Interesting that Matthew wrote that, isn't it? He's a tax collector. <laughs> let, him, let him be like what I used to be. He's uh, not getting his own debt. Yeah. And so truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Here's where he gets into the conversation about where two or three are gathered, which, you know, we've said has really nothing to do with the worship part of things. Um, but it, this whole thing he's been talking about, go, go into these people. So it's in that context that Peter says, well, then how often should we forgive them? How often do I need to go to that brother? How often do I need to go and take care of these things with him? What if this is his fifth time? What if this is his seventh time? Is this it? Do we stop here with this guy who's just refusing to listen to us? 
And then he tells the parable, look, God has forgiven you. Can you imagine what it was like to be God in the Old Testament with the children of Israel? I mean, how many times did he go back for them and go back for them? He even gives us a prophet who has this wife who continues to leave him and has to go back and get her so that the people could understand what it was like to be God. You know, like, you leave me all the time and I keep forgiving you and I keep forgiving you and I keep forgiving you. And that's the kind of love and forgiveness that God has. And he reminds us we've got to have that sort of patience, that sort of love, that sort of forgiveness in the way that we deal with each other. And it's not about that our sins are too great to be forgiven. It's that we fail to live like Jesus at the end of the day. If you can't pay the debt, if you have no way of paying the debt, it doesn't matter if you owe a billion dollars or 10 bucks. If you ain't got a way to pay the debt and none of us have the ability to pay the debt, you can't. It doesn't matter how good you are. Here we go, Will. Romans 7. If Paul can't do it, you can't do it. And in Romans 8, verse 12, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. You can't pay. If you owe God 10 bucks, there's no way you can pay 10 bucks. There's no way you can pay him a billion. We're all on the same playing field. It's just, are we allowing Jesus to cancel the debt? We're all outside of that. Can't pay it. I think with my kids, my kids are the ones that I think about all the time that I hold them and want to shake them and make them do better than I did when I was their age, right? The, the more I have my kids at my home, the more I appreciate my mom, right? And what she put up with. But then I turn around and put my kids in a worse spot than me. You know, I want to be, oh, you got to, got to do this. And I think, you know, even with my students here, you know, how many of them at 15 are better people than I, I was at 15? Mm. But like you said, Wes, it's not a comparison game. We're all debtors and there's only one guy who can pay our debt, you know, and, and, uh, do we buy that? That's the perspective. You know, am I a debtor? Can you admit that you owe a debt that you cannot pay? And, and that's really where the ball game starts. And, and this guy, you know, what he says to him when he comes to him, verse 33 or verse 32, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. I mean, you begged me for forgiveness. And then this guy comes and begs forgiveness from you. And you didn't have that same kind of mercy. Um, man, that would be a tough discussion to have with God on the day of judgment, wouldn't it? To, you know, stand before him and go, yeah, but you know what? They said, they said a bunch of stuff bad to me, God. You know, I just couldn't forgive them. Well, they, they said all these things. They did all these things. Do you, do you know how many times they cheated me? Do you know how many times they lied to me? And just... I wonder what God's face will look like when you say that to him, you know, do you know what you did to me? And yet I was willing to forgive you. I was willing to let that pass because my son's blood was shed for you. And then here we are holding some small grudge against somebody. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that uh, I'm equipped to have that conversation (laughs) because there are some, there are just some conversations in life that I, one, I don't want to have, and then two, I think I want to have, and then when I have them, I immediately regret that decision. <laughs> why, why did I jump off into this conversation? I knew better, but I thought I wanted it, and now I'm here. I don't want to be in that conversation and say, in that time, I thought I was smarter than God. <laughs> I thought I had a better plan than God did. I thought that I was justified in my actions. Rather than going to scripture and finding out a way to approach people, I thought, I know how to do this. I know a better way to do this. And there's one word that kind of keeps rolling around in my noggin when we're talking about this. And that word is discipline. Now, I tell my kids a lot in the youth street, being a Christian is not difficult. You know what's expected. You know what's required. You know what you have to do. You know where you're supposed to be. You know what you're not supposed to be doing? It's not difficult, but it does require some discipline. And it requires you making decisions and knowing when you're supposed to be giving and when you're supposed to be taking and when you're supposed to be doing things like you're supposed to be doing. It requires discipline. 
and I think that's what we're we're getting a lesson in sort of maybe in a in a in a different light if you look at it you're getting this we're getting this lesson of discipline here and this you have to condition yourself and discipline yourself well enough to know that I have a a God who loves me who created me who understands that I am not a perfect person and I'm going to make mistakes so why would I set someone else up for a definite failure in expecting their perfection because when we do that guys we're going to be super disappointed when we set perfection up as the goal for everybody else we're setting them up for failure and we're setting ourselves up for disappointment we just can't do that that requires discipline you know i mean i i uh you know i, I like blake blake's a blake's a friend of mine but he's wearing that auburn shirt today okay I, I, that that requires discipline. I mean, if you're going to pull for the Tigers, you got to be disciplined in staying in that mold. I, you know, hey, listen, kudos to you. I'm proud of you. I love you. But it requires <laughs> discipline to get to, to certain aspects of your life. And I think that's kind of what we're getting here. We're getting a lesson on you need to be disciplined enough to know that you've got all of this grace and this mercy. You need to be showing that to other people. When you when you think about it too, I think and Wes, yeah, I think you're starting to hit on this even more. And I'm not as smart as you, so I got to go even more practical. But I think to get to that point, there has to be the sense I've got to learn to forgive myself too. And I think that's kind of what you and Travis both are saying. Yes, I've got to understand. Here is this wonderful gift that I've been given. But I think that's probably one of the hardest things that we as Christians all do. And I know from Maywood after Maywood after Maywood, you know, and I'm sure the same for all of us, students have come up to us and go, I know God forgives me, but I just can't forgive myself. And if I can't forgive myself, then how can I move on to start showing that forgiveness to other people? So I would, I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts on, I mean, what are some tips for the people listening for me, myself, you know, to learn to start to forgive ourselves and really tap into this forgiveness and grace that God has put in our life? Well, I think it starts with one of our most basic uh, tendencies as Christian or as, as humans, even is, is selfishness. You know, we, we are so selfish. We want the best for ourselves. I mean, even as babies, you know, we, we need, we have needs, we have desires, we have things that we uh, want that are selfish. And uh, so I, I think if we can deny ourselves uh, then we can ultimately, uh, you know, reach that what you're talking about, Will. Well, when you're constantly continuing to do that, it is hard to forgive yourself. So, like, what what the discipline part of it and what Blake is saying is when we can begin to have that self-discipline, that self-control, you know, then we can feel as though God's going to forgive us. And I'm not sure that that's exactly the, where it starts, um, but for us, that's where we struggle is that, oh man, I messed up again. Same thing as when these other people mess up again and we have a hard time forgiving them. And he gives a little clue, I think in verse 35 at the very end of it, when he says, for each one of you to forgive his brother from your heart. Mm -hmm. And typically when we think about from the heart, we think about love. Um, and, and, and he's talking about, you know, if you remember, the, the greatest commands love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself you know it starts with loving me it starts with knowing that God loves me and that I've got a place with him if I can love myself then I can forgive myself I can understand that God loved me enough to forgive me and I think some of this, too, has to do with, I mean, you, you think about that God knew that we needed to forgive people. God knew that forgiveness that's held back just creates bitterness and frustration and anger. You know, Joseph forgiving his brothers, going back to this morning, you know, was as much for Joseph as it was for his brothers. Joseph had to forgive them probably years before this ever happened he had already forgiven his brothers. He'd made up his mind about that before they ever came to Egypt because Joseph recognized God's plan in all of it. Joseph saw the bigger picture in all of it. And Joseph understood that if I hold resentment to them, I'm just going to be bitter. 
Travis mentioned taking care of that with somebody else in his life. And that's the way that forgiveness works. You, you have to let go of it. It's just as much for you as it is for them. You know, I've got to get rid of this. Well, the same thing happens for me in forgiving myself, understanding that I need that. I need to know that God is gracious, that God is loving, that God is merciful. And that's what those words mean. You know, grace, not getting what we do deserve and mercy, um, getting what we don't deserve. Or grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And so, you know, those two things work hand in hand is what God's done for us. Then are we able to give that grace and that mercy and that love to other people? Travis, do you have something? Uh, did you say Travis? Yeah, it looked like you, it looked like you were getting ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, we know from entering into Jesus, we get there uh, through, through that baptism. We come in contact with the blood. We're buried like he is. And so that initial getting into Jesus, but then the remaining in Jesus, uh, 1 John chapter 1, uh, you know, if we confess our sins. Okay, so the first thing is, is do not trust default mode. I think that Lonnie Jones has said, you got two uh, compasses. Think about you got two compasses in your, in your pocket. The first one you pull out is always wrong, right? Your initial thought, especially if you're a, a brand new Christian, is probably not trustworthy, right? It, the first gut reaction you have, you know, one of the worst things Disney tells you is to follow your heart, right? Uh, Jesus tells you that out of your heart comes all kinds of issues and problems, all right? So the spirit, once we become Christians, that becomes our second compass, to righteousness that says, yes, your first thought's probably not the right one. Here's what the righteous one is also, obviously the word of God. And so how do we continue in that? Once we're a Christian, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that goes back to what Blake said, this idea of turning everything you did, you know, like for me to look perfect and keep up my facade and image of being religious and perfect is to not confess sins, right? But Jesus, God here tells us through Peter, no, the way to remain in the light is to confess your faults, you know? And so I wake up every day, you know, my, my wife already loves the perfect man and it's not Travis, it's Jesus, right? And because she loves him more than she loves me, that gives me a lot of, freedom to know and she knows and understands and her world's not shattered that Travis Creasy messed up today right and so my world's not shattered that Travis Creasy messed up today you know and so it's that leveling of expectations I don't I'm not perfect you know Romans 7 but Jesus is and, and because he is then I get this tremendous freedom to to chase it and it, it might catch excellence every once in a while quote Vince Lombardi, if we chase perfection, we'll never get there. But excellence, or I like the better word, righteousness, is attainable because of what Jesus has done. Mm -hmm. oh. I think confidence plays a role in that too. Um, because I think our confidence can't be built in ourselves. Our confidence has to be built on something greater. And it has to be focused on something greater. And so when we mess up or the people around us mess up, we need to have confidence in knowing that God is perfect and he sent a perfect savior for us. And we need to have our confidence there. And if we can do that, that separates the issue of uh, when we put ourselves in a position that somebody else is in and then it lowers our expectations for us and raises expectations for them. If our confidence is in us, that's what we naturally want to think. We want to think, well, it's not such a big deal here for me, but it's a huge deal over there for them. But if our confidence lies in God, if our confidence lies in Christ Jesus, then we have this, it's amazing how it works. And you guys have experienced it, and the people who watch this, they've, they've experienced it too. But it's amazing how things begin to level out when our confidence and our trust and our hope falls off of our shoulders and goes into the hands of God. It's amazing how your life just levels out and everything becomes 
instantly better. Doesn't mean it doesn't require discipline, but it's going to be a confidence that it's out of your hands and it's in the hands of the Almighty. I mean, what else do we need? I mean, when, when we've got that on our side, man, our, our sin is no different than anybody else's, but we all have the same level of forgiveness and repentance if that's what we seek after. The end of Hebrews 4, right? The, uh, you know, let us draw near with confidence, not because yeah. of us, but what Jesus did. So, right. Amen, brother. Y'all getting me fired up today, man. And I ain't got nowhere to go. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I think in, in just tying, I guess, a ribbon around this morning and this one is that idea Blake brought up too. If you didn't listen to this morning's at Highland Park, is dead and alive. You know, we were dead in our transgressions and in the uncircumcision of our flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of our transgressions. That's Colossians 2 and verse 13. And having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. So this idea of we were dead, now we're alive. We were in debt, we were guilty, and now we have found forgiveness and freedom in it. And to, to take it even further, Travis, I know you like this part, would be verse 15, and he has disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Um, we think about Jesus walking through the streets, um, being mocked, being spit upon, being talked about as he was going to the cross, and we see this suffering servant, this suffering savior, but what in reality was happening when Jesus was going to the cross was he was marching victoriously through the streets, making a public display of sin and death and Satan and everybody else like a king would coming in in a victory formation, you know, after this, you know, battle or whatever, he's bringing these people in, he's bringing all the goods in and he's making a public display of the things of sin and death. And so it's a really cool way, I think, in Colossians 2, where Paul helps us see how God flipped the script. Oh, look, he's, you know, we're killing the son of God. No, you're not. You, you know, you're just simply uh, making sure that his victory is absolutely sealed. And he did that because he was raised on the third day. He, has, he is alive. And because he is alive, we are forgiven. And because we're forgiven, then it ought to inspire us to go and to forgive other people. So I don't know what else to say about that, fellas. I think that's a, a, a pretty good, pretty good wrap up of that, of that one. And I hope you guys um, have enjoyed the study tonight and uh, thank you guys for joining us. Wes, thank you for being here with us. And uh, thank you very much for having me. I enjoy sitting down and talking with you guys. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, and Blake, of course, as always. And Will, you want to close us out with any thoughts? No, the only thing I was going to say was, you know, if you're watching, I know our world sees today as a day of renewal, you know, and if you need that, I know Wes is in Lauderdale County, Ben and Blake and myself are in Colbert County. Travis has got the state of Tennessee locked down. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you need anything, really, we're, we're here and we're available. Uh, and we want to do anything that we can to, either help you commit your life to Jesus or even to help you recommit um, as our whole world thinks about today and the resurrection of Jesus. So just want everybody to know that we're here and that we are definitely available and willing to help uh, when we can. So Blake, you want to lead us in a prayer? Yeah, let's pray together as we close. Dear God, we come before you thankful for another Lord's day. Another day that we've had the opportunity to gather with uh, friends and loved ones in our homes and study from your word. Uh, we're thankful for this time that we've had to dive into your word. We're thankful uh, for the Holy Spirit that has entered us in this study. We're thankful that uh, your parables can teach us uh, different things that has, as we should know about being Christians. 
we're thankful for the hope of heaven, uh, not something that we think that uh, might happen, that, but, but that we can be confident as we live our lives to reach heaven one day. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the tomb that was empty. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.